Welcome, everyone. Welcome to worship at Warsaw Presbyterian Church. It's a big morning for us. We have not only to install new elders, we're ordaining two new elders. That is a, a cause for celebration, is it not? Yay! Yay! Come on, well, yay! <laughs> so that, that is exciting, and we are very, very thrilled to have Travis and Logan um, joining us as elders this morning. Let's see our other, excuse me, other announcements. Um, we've got, is there any other announcement coming up? I know they canceled the World Day of Prayer, which would have been in March. So if anybody's looking out for that to be announced, that's not going to happen this year. Um, are there any other announcements that we need to bring to the floor? So, um, as we are, installing new elders we have some elders that are rolling off and we want to recognize the work of sandy bertucci and Kristen mcallister and kathy thompson we appreciate their service as elders and uh, want to recognize that so thank you guys all right any other announcements i guess let us continue with worship let's prepare our hearts for worship Yes, this is the prelude the dog ate a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to try to play it, but I don't think I'm supposed to because if you hear that, you know, hang on to your seat. I'm going to try not to play it, but we'll see.
we have one birthday this this morning to celebrate. Do we have the birthday song? We have, we have one birthday recorded, but we also have my mom's birthday is today and Dave's mom's birthday is tomorrow. Okay. The second? Okay. So want to say happy birthday, Bill. So happy, birthday. happy happy birthday. Well, we don't if it's already recorded, so so it's Bill and Margie and Dorothy. So that I think we have recorded for Bill. So let's, let's sing happy birthday. I can do it live if you want to. Oh, she can do it live. Shall we sing happy birthday live? Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> All right, let's get the order of names. Um, happy birthday to Bill. Happy birthday to Margie. Margie. Happy birthday to Dorothy. Happy birthday to you. Okay. Good luck, guys. All right. That helps you to turn the panel on. Okay. This will be our first live singing event again. There you go. All right, here we go. Sorry, I think I might have still been mic and I was kind of singing a little bit from the beginning of the slide. So, sort of trying to empower, can you look at us on this second deck of our Mercedes and the car? Help us to make a commitment of our lives, our spirits, and our hearts to minister to the world.
Good morning, God's children, God's holy children. Although we know that we fail time and time again to be holy, and God knows that, yet God still seeks after us. God still wants us in the divine presence, and that is an amazing thing. So as God's children who know that we fail time and again to be holy, let us join in the prayer of confession before God and one another. But we are slow to speak up about you. We are afraid we will be embarrassed, confronted, mocked. Forgive us. God incarnate Jesus, you prayed not to die on the cross, but you obeyed. When we are called to do hard, frightening disciples' work, we make excuses or hide. Forgive us. Lord God, you call us to be disciples and promise to be with us. Give us the courage we need. For we pray in your name. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, hear the good news. God is merciful and full of steadfast love. God will not forget us. God will wash us clean and lead us on paths of steadfast love and righteousness and faithfulness. We are a forgiven people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And as a as a people who are forgiven and confident in the peace that Christ shares with us, let us share that peace with one another. Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
sometimes we're expecting one thing and another thing actually happens. So sometimes we're expecting ice cream when we get back. Or sometimes we're expecting black when we get ice cream. And sometimes surprises are good, and sometimes they're also good. Sometimes God surprises us too by having us do things that we don't think we can do. Okay. Yeah, that's what you can do. And sometimes we'll come things that are, you know, maybe hard to do. But God gives us the strength and the love to do that. Okay? So let's pray together. I'll give you a quick question. Dear God, thank you for loving us and giving us the strength to do the surprising things that you ask us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from Genesis 17, 15 through 16. God said to Abraham, As for Sarari, your wife, you shall not call her Sarari, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Our second reading will come from Romans 4, 13 through 17. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of law who are to be their heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, the promise depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Our gospel reading today comes from Mark's gospel, chapter 8, starting in verse 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he, rebu he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take up your cross. You know, when we say, when we think of cross, we think of Jesus, right? We, we think of the, the, the cross. It's a symbol of, of love, of forgiveness even resurrection. Imagine Jesus saying, take up your electric chair, take up your noose, take up your gallows, 
take up your lethal injection. Imagine if Jesus used a word or a phrase there that we recognize as a means of execution, because that's what he says here. To those who were listening, they weren't thinking a symbol of, of religion. They were thinking a symbol of death, of execution. Imagine if those were the words that you heard. Now the context here is key. When this talk about suffering is taken all by itself, it's it's difficult. Well, it's difficult anyway, but it, it kind of makes it sound like the whole mission is to suffer and die. Now, there, there is the theology of atonement, and I'm not arguing against that. I'm just saying that that's not necessarily what's going on here. He's not saying that his mission is just to suffer and die. He's saying that he will suffer and die. He will die on a cross because of his mission. We know that his mission was not to bring death to us, but to bring life. And we also know that the earthly powers violently, violently opposed him. You see, this passage picks up in the middle of a private conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And the first part of that conversation was Jesus saying, well, who, who do the people say that I am? And, and do you remember the answers? Some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're one of the prophets. Those are all great things. And then Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. And in Mark's version, the very next verse is, he sternly ordered them to tell no one. Then we pick up with our text for today. Teaching them about picking up their cross and following him. Teaching them about the suffering they must undergo. hard to it's, it's, it's kind of hard to put all together if you're just looking at this conversation but when we look at it in the bigger picture we see what he's talking about you see the guys that are following him they're pretty they're pretty excited about following the messiah now I used to live in a town called Lincoln, Illinois, and they're big, they're, they were very proud of this fact. They named their town Lincoln before, after Abraham Lincoln, but before he became president. They're very proud that they saw the greatness first. Very excited about that. So you imagine these, these guys, they're, they're following the Messiah and they're the first ones to, to see it. They're excited about that. They're pretty pumped about it. I mean, just a couple of pages in your Bible, if you turn over, you see that they're arguing about which one of them is the greatest, which one will sit on the left and on the right when he comes into his glory. They're vying for the best seats in the house. It's hard to blame them. They've, they've witnessed a lot of awesome stuff. They've, the, the fanfare of all the people following him, the healings. They've witnessed him kind of sparring with the religious leaders and winning. They're pretty excited about it. This Jesus guy looks like he's kind of a big deal. And they're really glad to have hitched their wagon to his. And then this. The son of man must die. Pick up your cross, go with me. Oh, you know, up until this point, Jesus has spoken a little bit about persecution, but, but not clearly. The text says now he clearly, openly talks about what he must do. He must undergo rejection and suffering and death. Yes, he'll rise again. And yes, the persecuted and the martyred disciples will receive a new life. But 
The hard truth he's saying here is that the road to the messianic glory runs right through Golgotha, the place of the cross. He tells them that as his disciples, they are following him to a cross. Now, Mark does not argue here that that's the primary mission of Jesus' incarnation, that the primary purpose is to suffer and die. In this, in this context, what Mark is saying is that the cross is a consequence of the greater mission. I'm not arguing against the atonement. I, I, I affirm that. I'm just saying if that's what you're, if you stop there, you miss what he says in this text which is when you follow me, people will be mad. Even in the face of conflict, Jesus is unflinching in his insistence that the divine mission to welcome and reconcile sinners overrides the stigma of associating with them. The divine mission overrides the anger of the powers that be. The divine mission to alleviate human suffering overrides any, any religious or human tradition that gets in the way. Now, let me be clear, this is not like a Christian correction to the legalistic Judaism. This is what the prophets have said all along. It's a radical channeling of this long-standing belief in God's compassion for the marginalized. And as the messianic emissary of this divine mission, Jesus inevitably elicits antagonism, even violent antagonism from the ones who are invested in maintaining the status quo. It's not hard to see why Peter so quickly rebukes Jesus. You see, the disciples, they're captivated by the hopes of earthly glory and they're preoccupied more with the messianic title than with the life-giving mission. Of course, the title Messiah establishes Jesus' God-given authority. But that title, Messiah, becomes dangerously suspect when we detach it from Jesus' mission. And his mission throughout, throughout the entire narrative of the Bible is on behalf of the broken and the outcast. You see, Jesus would rather see people following him unpretentiously in this mission of reaching to the world the broken and hurting world. He'd rather see us quietly, even anonymously sometimes, working to bring healing and hope than waving flags or posting memes. This is such an important point that Jesus calls Peter Satan for his self-serving confusion of the title and the mission. Now there is one thing that Peter and Jesus do agree on, that their futures are wrapped up together. But the question is, will Peter embrace Jesus' definition of his mission or his own? Jesus' definition is really the only one that counts. And this question over the cross of glory or the cross of suffering, this is the question over which the fellowship now begins to deteriorate and ultimately dissolves. You remember the disciples in the end betray and deny Jesus because the cost is so high. This is a hard message for us today. So much of North American Christianity is, 
founded on a comfortable affiliation with Jesus. There's so little cost to our discipleship. For some Jews, some Christians are persecuted in other parts of the world. And if we are to find relevance for this passage in our context, in our lives today, we need to bear in mind that discipleship equals participating in Jesus' ministry. What makes the ministry of Jesus countercultural makes it the object of hostility. Then and now, people are hostile to the Christian message, not because it's Christian per se, but because it doesn't accept excuses. Jesus is saying, if you want to be my followers, be my body, be my hands, be my feet, love the least of these, bring hope and healing where it doesn't exist. It doesn't line out item by item how to do that because it's going to be different in not only in each culture, but in each one of our lives, it's going to be different. But if we want to be Jesus' disciples, we bring hope, we bring healing at all costs. Let us pray. Lord, you stop us in our tracks with your reminder that discipleship is not a sometime thing. In the same way that your love for us is not a sometime thing. We are called to place our whole lives in your care, to follow you always, not just once in a while. We admit that we do this imperfectly. We focus sometimes on the wrong side of the equation because the demand is great, the need is great, our energies are limited. But on the other side, of the equation. You give us the strength and the courage that we need for each step on this journey. Lord, help us to listen for your guidance. Lead us to be one in your will and to hear your call. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. And now I invite um, the Cork of Session and our two new elders to, to come down. Oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't plan for the courts. We need to be over here. Um, They're still here. This is ordination in the time of pandemic. We read in scripture that there are varieties of gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the spirit to be used for the common good. And together, we are the body of Christ, and individually we are members of it. We are called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism, 
and marked by Christ by his own Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. So within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, as ministers of the sacrament. Ordination is a gift of Christ to the church. It ensures that Christ's ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, and for the preaching of the word and the celebration of the sacrament. As God calls some to particular forms of ministry, God calls us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptismal vows. Renouncing all that opposes God in God's rule and affirming the faith of the Holy Universal Church. To the Church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn away from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world, including being so I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love, do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing him love? Will you? And so let us confess our faith together. We believe in God the Father. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Do Well, thank 
baptism, you were praying by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ, and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share the mission of the world. Christ, in baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ, and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Both of you are now called by God through the voice of the church for service and ministry in Jesus' name. In according with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church, for your commitment to this call by responding to these questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge the Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you. Do you, do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? I do. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life? Seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world. Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Will you be a faithful ruling elder? Watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service. Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Oh. To be the members of the church, except Travis and Logan as the way elders. Spoken by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, and to respect their decisions, and to follow as their guidance? Serving Jesus Christ to the most of the men of the church. Do we? Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise through the ages and in every place. You have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for the ancestors of the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. For judges and monarchs who rule in righteousness and peace. For prophets and apostles who spoke your words of mercy and truth. For leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and in faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ who came not to be served but to serve, to give his life and set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit to proclaim your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all that he said and did. Versus God, pour out your spirit upon your servants, Logan and Travis, whom you have called by baptism as your own. Grant in the same mind that was in Christ Jesus.
invite those who are who are members of the, of the families and who wish to come and lay on hands and those who uh, don't already share your own love with Christ to, to extend your hands in a symbol of laying on and reparation. Travis and Logan, you are ruling elders ordained to the ministries of service and governance. In the Church of Jesus Christ for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Also, as elders of the Church of Jesus Christ and specifically in the service of this church, we are so glad to have you as brothers in Christ. Go ahead and turn around and say hi to everybody, as if they don't know you. So. <laughs> Resent Logan and Travis as your new elders. Thanks for the time. Travis, as our new elders, have received your affirmation and your promise to support, to pray for, to work alongside. That promise extends not only to our new elders, but to all active elders. And the attitude of service extends to all who have been ordained elders, whether active or not. We give thanks for each of you who have taken that vow of ordination. As members of the body of Christ. Amen. Now let us continue with worship with blessed assurance.
here all the day long. We come to this time as the body of Christ when we share those things that are on our hearts and on our minds. We have in our some uh, prayer requests. Are there any others to add to that? Some, some faces we've missed here today that we've had such a long time apart and it's good that we are slowly coming back together um, just wonderful see no other than us okay, so mm-hmm. um, if we could say an extra prayer for Sammy and Mark's family um, Mark is going to be starting an adventure Yes. Yes, we will keep you guys in prayer. Very nice. So we'll lift up the Bensinger family, we'll lift up the Kerr family, and um, the family of Robert's cousin Karen and her cousin Kenneth. We'll lift up the family and friends of Richard Mulch. We lift up with with prayers of, of concern and of joy. Some of them fingers progress. Okay. So he's right, so. yeah. not feeling well today. So we do we have one good day? We might have one good day. But um, we look forward to many, many more. But for today, we pray for Simon um, to feel better. And we uh, also looked at uh, Kathy Thompson's family, um, her friend at Ron Mason, and her uncle, Robert Coots. Let us go to God in prayer. Redeemer God, we pray, knowing that you are with us on this Lenten journey. Help us to discern what is our cross to bear, and help us to bear it with the grace and conviction that reflect you. Give us the courage to name suffering and evil and to stand with all who resist oppressive forces of this world. Empower us to stand with one another so that we may eradicate the poverty of means and of spirit that threatens to enslave us. Inspire us to see you in the eyes of one another. Sustain our God, we pray for the loneliness and the isolation that lingers in the midst of this pandemic. We pray for the many disruptions of our lives, some of which have silver lines, but many that do not. We lift the names of ones we have sat on. We lift the many whose names and faces we hold silently in our hearts. Comfort our God, we pray for all who grieve and his uncomforted grief remains an open wound of loss. Rejoicing, God, we pray in praise for the reminders of your prayer for us. We give thanks for those who celebrate birthdays. We give thanks for promises of healing, for glimpses of healing. We praise you for guidance and the care that you show for us. We praise you for the good news of new beginnings. We praise you for the willing hearts of your servants, Logan and Travis. We praise you for the service of elders Sandy and Kristen and Kathy. We praise you for the ministry of this church and all the churches in our community. Holy God, we pray for the church, for your church, not that we doubt it will survive, for we know that it will, 
But Lord, we pray that we may be part of it. Lead us in new ways to live your mission. Bring us into the beloved community. Show through us the boldness of your spirit. Be with us. Help us to remember that your love is poured out for all people, that you are never far away from us. We pray as your people. We pray as you taught us, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God is a fountain of good gifts that are bestowed upon us. So let us respond to these gifts by returning a portion of our resources as a sign that all of who we are is a gift from God. I invite you, as you read, to put your, place your offerings in the place at the back. And we celebrate those offerings. Oh. 